I rise today to talk on a matter with my colleague, Senator Warner, and I understood that Senator Warner and I had the time from 4.15 to 5 o'clock that was generously given to us by Senator Sanders, who had the time from 4 to 5 o'clock, and unfortunately, Senator Harkin has gone over and used some of Senator Sanders' time, but, uh, and I know Senator Kirk is coming down to give his maiden speech at 5 o'clock. I hope he would bear with us as we uh, have a number of folks who are going to speak very quickly today on an issue that is of major importance to America. Mr. President, America's fiscal house is in disarray. Our budget process is broken, and future generations will end up paying the price if we continue to ignore the difficult decisions required to fix things at this grave threat to our country's fiscal stability. Recently, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform has worked in a bipartisan manner to produce recommendations on how to best address our current levels of debt. While these recommendations may not reflect the beliefs of all members of this body, I commend the Commission's members for having the courage and the open minds to tackle the problems. At the very least, their recommendations can serve as a starting point for a serious debate on how we can ensure a better life for our children and our grandchildren. Today, spending has reached almost 24 percent of America's gross domestic product, while our revenues were at their lowest levels last year in 60 years. Not too long ago, the debt ceiling was increased by the largest amount in history, $1.9 trillion, nearly twice as large as the previous record of $984 billion. Our current statutory limit on the public debt is now set at $14.24 trillion and is expected to require an increase again sometime this spring. Now, Mr. President, with that backdrop, Senator Warner and I began talking this summer about this grave issue that's facing America and about the fact that if we don't address it now, then it's going to be too late and that it was incumbent upon us to try to educate ourselves as well as educate other members of this body about the seriousness of this issue and what is the way forward. So we began talking among ourselves. We expanded our group, expanded and expanded, and we now have a significant number of senators who are prepared to come forth and say we've got to address this and we've got to address it next year. Some of the members of that group are going to be here today to give their thoughts on it. And we're going to be joined by several Republicans and Democrats to pledge our commitment to addressing this issue and addressing it in the right way. I want to thank my friend Senator Warner for his leadership, for his commitment to do this. It's been a pleasure to work with him. And as we move forward next year, this group is going to provide the momentum to carry the ball to make sure that we address the issue of reductions in spending as well as major tax reform to get the fiscal house of the United States back in order. With that, Mr. President, I would yield to Senator Warner. The Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, let me uh, echo my comments to my good friend, the Senator from Georgia, Senator Chambliss. Um, it is time for us in this Senate, and excuse the language, but to put up or shut up. A lot of folks talk about deficit reduction in both parties time and again, but over the next year there is a growing group of us, and I think folks will see this group uh, in the next 45 minutes, hopefully briefly each one of us, uh, start to raise the issue that next year we have to take on deficit reduction and major tax reform. Country's approaching $14 trillion in national debt. It's been estimated that every day that we delay, we add close to $5 billion to that national debt. So whether your issue is the solvency of Social Security, whether your issue is tax rates, whether your issue is making sure that we pass on a balance sheet to our kids and our grandkids that allow America to continue to be the economic superpower that it has been, Unless we take on this issue, we won't be able to accomplish those goals. And while I believe, as imperfect as this uh, compromise between the President and others in terms of short-term stimulus that we will vote on later tonight, we also have to demonstrate that this body can actually walk and chew gum, that we can do short-term stimulus now, but next year engage in meaningful tax reform and deficit reduction. Because if we act later tonight, we will be adding $900 billion over the next two years 
to our national deficit. So today, and we'll come back on a regular basis, you're going to hear very briefly from a number of my colleagues on both sides, Al, and I think in a new respectful way. We may not agree on the ultimate solutions, but we are going to agree to listen to each other respectfully and recognize at the end of the day, meaningful tax reform and meaningful deficit reduction has to be a goal of this Senate, of this Congress in the next year. I yield the floor to my good friend, the Senator from Mississippi. Mr. President. Senator from Mississippi. Mr. President, I'm glad to join this bipartisan group today. I see 10 of us on the floor at, at this time. We all have agreed to speak briefly about this because we want to make the case that over the next several months, uh, we mean business and we intend to, uh, to do what we can to actually make some tough choices. I join my colleague from Georgia in commending the membership of the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform and uh, particularly the leaders of this group. Uh, Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, great patriots, uh, people with uh, a great history of service in their own right. They've come forward with some recommendations. Uh, in their preamble, they make it clear uh, none of us likes every element of the plan. But they put forward a plan that I think is a starting point for us. And we intend to use these next few months. Frankly, we intend to use the run-up to the vote that we will have to take on the debt ceiling uh, around April of 2011 to make real progress. Let me subscribe to several of the statements made in the preamble of this Fiscal Responsibility Commission. They say we cannot play games or put off hard choices any longer. I think the American people know that and they expect leadership from their elected representatives in the House and Senate in that, in that regard. The report in the preamble goes on to say the American people are counting on us to put politics, politics aside. And that's what we're trying to do on the floor today with a bipartisan re representation. Pull together and not pull apart and agree on a plan to live within our means and to make America strong for the long haul. It's been pointed out that Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the most significant threat to national security today is our national debt. I agree with Admiral Mullen on that and I think American Americans agree also. Uh, kicking the can down the road is not going to suffice any longer to, uh, to quote uh, our colleague from Oklahoma, Senator Tom Coburn. The preamble goes on to say, the contagion of debt that began in Greece and continues to sweep through Europe shows us clearly that no economy will be immune. No economy, not even the United States economy. If the U.S. does not put its house in order, the reckoning will be sure and the devastation severe. The title of the report of the commission, Mr. President, is the moment of truth. And I think we're here on the floor of the Senate today on the 14th of December 2010 to say that there's a bipartisan working group that believes we have arrived at a pivotal moment of truth, and we intend to get down to the business of rectifying the problem of national spending and our national debt. And I yield to my friend from Montana. Mr. President. The Senator from Montana. I would like to thank Senator Wicker for his, his remarks. I, uh, I, I rise to share a few words also about the debt and about the uh, bipartisan tax cut compromise that we will vote on this evening. Before I get into these remarks, I, th I want to thank uh, the good Senator uh, Senator Warner and, and, and Senator Shambliss for their good work uh, in, in putting together um, a group of senators to, to help address this issue in a bipartisan way. As far as the compromise tonight, um, I look forward to voting for this compromise. Uh, it is a matter of creating jobs and rebuilding the economy. I think the bill does that. Is it a compromise plan that I would have written? Uh, no. Uh, but it does cut taxes for the folks that need tax relief the most middle class families, small businesses, family farms and ranches. They are the real job creators in this country and aiming tax relief at them uh, required compromise working together and it happened and it's a victory for all Montanans and it's a victory for all Americans. Mr. President, I want to point out another example of working together. Over the past few days, a number of my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, independents, 22 in all, teamed up to put forth a resolution that we hope will be a part of this package that we will vote on tonight. This resolution puts all of us on record, expressing our deep concerns about the unsustainable path of this country's debt. 
ensuring our commitment to working together to uh, pull ourselves together and, and, and dig ourselves out of a ditch that we're in. And to do that, any plan will have to have tax reform, spending cuts, and deficit reduction. It's not going to be an easy process. In order to have a serious debate about cutting our debt, we're going to need, we're going to, need to make some tough decisions, not just pay it lip service or play political games. Just like the report of the President's Commission on Fiscal Responsibility, there are a lot of things that members of this group and of this body are not going to like in any potential plan. But what's important here is that all of these members are serious about putting this country on a sustainable path and are committed to devising and voting on a plan to do that within the next 12 months. It's that important of an issue. This is hands down the most important issue that this Senate will deal with over the next few years. Putting our nation's economy on a sustainable path uh, to control this country's debt and to offer opportunity for the future. Mr. President, I look forward to working with my colleagues on this issue because I know they share my same commitment to getting something done. The truth is we're not going to be able to get anywhere unless we trust one another. This process isn't going to be pleasant for anyone, but we can be successful if we have a bipartisan effort. Mr. President, this bipartisan resolution is more than just lip service. It is a plan to move forward together. And I yield the floor to my friend from Nebraska, Senator Johans. Thanks, Senator Tester, Mr. Senator President. from Nebraska. This is a, a rather remarkable moment. On each side, Republicans and Democrats are standing to describe a problem that literally jeopardizes not just the future of our children, our grandchildren, but it jeopardizes our security, and that is our runaway spending and our deficit. Let me, if I might, put this in perspective, Mr. President. As a former governor of Nebraska, I used to tell my cabinet when we were struggling through budget issues, this is not magic, it's math. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with here. We simply have a problem that is so gigantic it can only be solved in a bipartisan way. Let me offer a couple of statistics to back that statement up. If you look at the entire federal budget, Mr. President, this is what you see. If you add Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and the interest we pay on our debt, that is 64 cents of every dollar we spend annually. Let me repeat those programs, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and the interest we pay on our debt. Everybody will acknowledge the importance of those programs. Now let's compare that to the revenues that are coming in this year. The revenues coming in don't even cover the full cost of those programs. So if anyone is out there suggesting that a little nip and a little tuck and a tweak here and a tweak there is going to solve this problem, it just fundamentally won't. You literally have a situation where if you just shut down the entire federal government, national defense, every single program out there except the ones I mentioned, you would still come up a bit short. We need to fundamentally change how we are operating this government because quite honestly, to date, we all recognize, Democrats and Republicans, that we have been operating this government on the credit card of our children and our grandchildren, and it can't work. It just simply can't work any longer. So I conclude my comments today by saying I appreciate the opportunity to work with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, to work with my colleagues on this side of the aisle, to try to solve what I consider the most pressing, most urgent need our nation faces today. Mr. President, I yield the floor to Senator Wyden. President. The Senator from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to commend Senator Warner and Senator Chambliss in particular <clears throat> for their important work. And tomorrow it will be even more important given that this agreement will pass tonight. Mr. President, there is always another election around the corner, a big array of special interest groups that need to be satisfied, and a constant stream of public opinion polling 
that politicians live and die for? Why take action that could offend a group today if you can put it off for a while? The agreement that will pass tonight, in my view, is a victory for the politics of procrastination. At a time when Americans are swimming in debt, more water will be put into the pool. Instead of taking steps to fix the market distorting, job-killing tax code, last overhauled a quarter century ago, when China and India were blips in the global economy, this tonight will prop up our broken tax code. Millions of Americans are out of work, small businesses are closing their door, and instead of finding permanent solutions to the problem, the agreement is smiling like Scarlett O'Hara saying, fiddle-dee-dee, I'll think about it tomorrow. Mr. President, it did not have to be this way. As Senator Warner and colleagues have mentioned, there was a blueprint provided by the Deficit Commission. I don't happen to agree with everything, but clearly it was a very important blueprint. In the 80s, and I see Senator Alexander clearly remembers those days, President Reagan and Democrats worked for bipartisan tax reform to clean out the loopholes, hold down the rates, and keep progressivity. In the two years, colleagues, after Democrats and Ronald Reagan worked together, our economy grew by 6.3 million jobs, twice, twice the number that were created between 2001 and 2008, when tax policy was purely partisan. I don't think it had to be this way. Senator Warner and Senator Chambliss tried very hard to add a provision that might at some point insert consequences for inaction. Colleagues, and I'll close with this, nothing will happen in this town where there is this culture of procrastination unless there aren't some consequences for inaction. There are provisions in this measure tonight that I support very strongly. Unemployment insurance, help for the middle class, a small business. I was willing to extend the whole Bush era program for a year in order to force action. But that's not going to be done. Tonight, I intend to vote no. Tomorrow, I'll be back with Senator Warner and Senator Chambliss to build on the good work of the Deficit Commission, build on the good work that Democrats and Ronald Reagan did in the 80s to give us a model so that finally, in this country, we tackle the major problems, debt reduction, and fixing the job-killing tax code to bring back the middle class to the prosperity they deserve. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Idaho. Mr. President, I also am honored and uh, very appreciative of the opportunity to join this bipartisan group who is speaking to the nation tonight about the fact that we cannot any longer delay dealing with the most significant threat our nation faces, our debt and our fiscal difficulties. I was one of the members of the President's Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform and had the opportunity over the past year to work on a bipartisan basis with people on that commission who took testimony from experts, evaluated the issues, studied the economies of the world, studied the details of what was happening in the American economy, and came forward with a plan. This plan got 11 of the 18 votes on that commission. It was required by the President's order to get 14 of the 18 votes in order to force that plan to Congress for a vote. And I was disappointed that that didn't happen. But let me make a couple of points of clarification. 11 of the 18 votes represents over 60% of the votes of the commissioners on that commission. That's enough votes to pass any bill in this Senate. It's enough votes to pass any bill in the House of Representatives and to get that bill to the desk of the President. 14 of 18 would have been over 77% of the votes, a margin that has rarely been met in this Congress. My point in making this clarification is to say that on a bipartisan basis, we were able to come up with a supermajority of support on the commission for a plan. Now, did that plan contain everything that I wanted and leave nothing out that I didn't like? No. There were parts of that plan that caused me great heartburn. But that plan did put America on a path toward a balanced budget. 
It stopped the erosion. No, in fact, it stopped the explosion of our debt across this country. And it did so in a way that focused on the right elements. What were those? Spending and tax reform. Many of us were worried at the outset that the Commission would focus on just trying to solve the problem with more tax increases and tell the American people that our spending habits here in Congress were too important to be dealt with and we simply have to increase your taxes in order to keep Congress spending at its breakneck rate. The Commission denied that fact and said the reality is the problem in Congress is they spend too much and it puts spending caps on discretionary spending and started at least, not as much as I thought it should do, but at least started the debate about how to deal with our entitlements. And one very important addition, it proposed a major reform of our tax code, probably the most sweeping tax reform that I've seen in my lifetime. If you were to try to come up with a tax code that is more unfair, more complex, more costly to comply with, and more anti-competitive to Americans seeking to do business in the world, you probably couldn't do much worse than we've done with our tax code. And one of the most important parts of dealing with our fiscal policy is to reform that tax code. And so that's another reason I'm so glad to see that we have bipartisan support for that kind of reform. I would simply say as I close that I am heartened by the fact that we see Republicans and Democrats alike saying the time for further inaction is gone. The time for gridlock is gone. We do not have time to continue the kind of gridlock debate that we have seen over the years here in Congress as we deal with this issue. And it's my hope that in the near future, we will force process reforms in this Congress that will put votes on the difficult issues that we must face as Americans before us. And with that, Mr. President, I, uh, yield, my time, or I yield my time and uh, yield the floor to the Senator from North Carolina. Mr. President. The Senator from North Carolina. Thank you. When the Fiscal Commission released its report on December 1st, it started with a guiding principle that all Americans can agree on. We have a duty to make America better off tomorrow than it is today. But the picture is pretty bleak right now. Let me give you a few examples. In 1982, our deficit had never exceeded $100 billion. By March of 2004, 22 years later, the debt was $3.7 trillion. And today, six years past, the debt held by the public has ballooned to $8.7 trillion. The federal debt was 33% of GDP in 2001. It's now 62% and on a trajectory to reach 90% of GDP by 2020. Interest on our national debt could rise to nearly $1 trillion annually by 2020. Mr. President, that is the entire amount of individual income taxes we are collecting this year. It's impossible to look at these numbers and believe that this trajectory will result in an America that's better for our children than it is for us. We can't continue to just grow the debt and run huge deficits each year with the expectation that our children will pay the bill. This trend of borrowing will eventually have to come to an end, one way or, or another. The only question is how. Are we going to reduce our deficit responsibly in a bipartisan fashion and in a way that encourages investment and economic growth? Or are we going to cruise blissfully along until some external crisis forces us to make these adjustments in the most sudden and painful way possible. The time for Congress to act is now. There's a mounting chorus growing from all sides that recognizes our current path is unsustainable. 11 members of the Fiscal Commission voted for the Bipartisan Deficit Reduction Report, including my friends, the senators from Illinois, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Idaho, and New Hampshire. Just today, Monday's announcement, Moody's announcement, that it could move a step closer to cutting the AAA rating on, its, on our U.S. debt. That's why I am here today joining with my colleagues in vigorous support of concerted bipartisan action on the deficit in 2011 and the resolution introduced by my colleague, Senator Shambliss and Senator Warner. Mr. President, it is past time to get to work. We need to think seriously about reforming the tax code 
and tackling the deficits and the debt in a civil and bipartisan manner, and we need to do it now. Mr. President, I yield the floor. President, Senator from Idaho. Mr. President, uh, fellow senators, uh, I rise today to speak very briefly uh, about this issue. This easily could be the most serious issue that we deal with uh, in recent years and in future years. We have an enemy today that is at the door. This is an enemy that is out there somewhere and you can talk about uh, philosophically. It's an enemy that is at the door. Last year, the federal government spent around $3.8 trillion. That really doesn't mean anything to me or probably much to anybody because nobody knows what $3.8 trillion is. If you say it's a little over $7 million a minute, it starts to sound a little bit uh, more uh, like you could understand it. But none of that is important. It's how much do you have? And the federal government was short 41% of that money. 41 cents out of every dollar that the United States government spent, it borrowed. I hope everyone listened closely uh, to the senator from Nebraska when he said that if we funded only Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the interest on the national debt, we would be short of the money coming in to pay for that. If you shut down all other aspects of the federal government, you still couldn't put it in the black if you paid for just those. The, the, this moment in history is an absolutely critical moment for the American people. We've gotten jaded because all of our lives we've heard about the national debt and we've heard about annual deficits and we get jaded about it. But these numbers today are real, they are serious, and they could bring down this government. There is absolutely no question about that. This Congress has to do something about that, and it's not going to be done by Republicans. It's not going to be done by Democrats. It is going to take a bipartisan effort to do that. I'm here today to support that. I want to yield the floor to my good friend, uh, Senator Udall from Colorado. Madam President. The Senator from Colorado. Madam President, I'm uh, pleased and proud to follow my colleague from Idaho, and what we're hearing about here is that of all the challenges that uh, face our nation, and there are many of them right now, that this massive set of annual budget deficits and the overall debt that we face, it's a crippling debt, probably are the most serious and difficult uh, efforts that we have to, where we're facing right now as a people. Uh, a strong country, I heard Senator Wyden say this in effect, is a solvent country. And conversely, a broke country is a, is a weak country. I can't help but remember Erskine Bowles, the, the chairman, co-chairman of the commission that we're talking about today. He was asked, why are interest rates still low and why are our bonds still desirable? He said, let's not fool ourselves. And Senator Shambliss would appreciate this because he used a southern turn of phrase. He said, look, we're still the best looking horse in the glue factory. That's the only reason that our interest rates and our bonds are still strong. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a way forward. The bipartisan commission has put in front of us a plan that we don't, none of us agree with every single item, but it's a way forward. And it's important to also note that of the 11 votes, five of those votes, I believe, were senators from our body. Five of our six senators who represented us on that commission voted to move forward. So that's the way forward, is for us to join together, Democrats and Republicans alike. And despite our differences of opinion on many other issues, we can agree, I think, on one thing. And that's developing fundamental tax reform and addressing in the process our long-term debt problems. Now, like Senator Wyden, I'm going to vote no tonight. I think this is a misguided effort, and we will add $900 billion to, to our debt load. But I respect my colleagues who see it otherwise. But I'm going to vote no. I'm going to come right back here to work tomorrow with all of us here in the chamber. We're going to meet this challenge head on. The stakes are too high if we don't. Madam President, I yield the floor to... Uh, the senator from Tennessee, Senator Alexander. Mr. Mr. President. The senator from Tennessee. I'm, I'm here tonight in the spirit of my late friend, uh, the author of Roots, Alex Haley, who lived and uh, died by these words, find the good and praise it. I'm, I'm here to commend Senator Warner, Senator Chambliss, and, and the bipartisan group of senators who have focused their attention on this urgent crisis that our country faces the national debt. This is the way the Senate is supposed to work, to see an urgent need, develop a bipartisan consensus to go to work on it, come up with a strategy to deal with it, 
and get a result, not just make speeches, but get a result. We've heard the evidence. We've had the good example set by five members of our body, two Democrats, three Republicans who took a courageous step in their action on the, on the fiscal commission the other day. We should follow that example. But I'm so encouraged by what I hear. I mean, this is the way the Senate is supposed to work. Let me conclude with just one example from history. I was picked up a book the other night called The British Overseas. It's a British historian's view of the American Revolution. You can imagine what some of the comments might be written several years ago. It pointed this out, that at the time of the American Revolution, the interest on the national debt of the British Empire amounted to one half of the national revenue of the British Empire. In other words, at the time we won our independence, Great Britain had an unconscionable debt, and it forced them into some imprudent decisions. One was the Stamp Act, and one was a little tax on tea, which occurred at about that time. So big debts force big countries into bad decisions. The leadership that we've seen across the aisle is a good start toward a serious effort toward dealing with our debt crisis. I'm here today to commend those senators, both Democrats and Republicans, who are part of it. I yield the floor to the distinguished senator from Colorado. Madam President. The senator from Colorado. Madam President, I'm so pleased to be here in, in this room with Democrats and Republicans talking constructively with each other about something that's been a long time uh, since we've seen that, and it's one of the things that I heard day after day after day over the last 22 months as I had town hall meetings across the state of Colorado. I, too, wanted to read something from the, the words of the Deficit and Debt Commission, because I think it's important for people to understand, people that are watching this at home, and people working in Washington, that this is not optional. They write, large debt will put America at risk by exposing it to foreign creditors. They currently own more than half of our public debt, and the interest we pay them reduces our own standard of living. The single largest foreign holder of our debt is China, a nation, they write, that may not share our country's aspirations and strategic interests. In a worst-case scenario, investors would lose confidence that our nation is able or willing to repay its loans, possibly triggering a debt crisis that would force the government to implement the most stringent of austerity measures. As, as the President knows, uh, I had never run for office before this election. I spent half my life in the private sector and half uh, working in things like the Denver Public Schools. Our former Secretary of Education is here today. Nothing else in the world runs like this. Nowhere else would we say to ourselves that our theory is that we're going to look the other way borrow the money from the Chinese, one of our greatest competitors, and stick our kids with the bills. And the reason this has become so important now is because the size and the scale of this debt puts us in the position where one day, and I'll close with this, Madam President, where one day somebody may say, I'm not going to buy your debt at that price. And the day that happens, our interest rates are going to spike, and this recession is going to look like nothing compared to what we're going to face. We owe it to our kids and our grandkids to make sure that we're paying our way, and I'm so pleased that we're here today in a bipartisan way to talk about this. Madam President. Virginia. Um, I know that Senator from Illinois is going to be doing his maiden speech in a couple of moments. I would ask his forbearance for an extra uh, four or five minutes if, if our, my, our colleagues all could be brief. We've been a little bit oversubscribed, which I think is an indication uh, of the enormous interest in this issue. And I know Senator Shaheen, Senator Corker, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Nelson um, uh, wanted to speak briefly on this issue. And if the Senator from Illinois uh, would grant us those couple of minutes, we would all be very grateful. Because I know he will be, once he makes his maiden speech, part of this, uh, part of this effort as well. So with that, to uh, Senator Corker. Madam President. The Senator from Tennessee. Thank you very much. Uh, I rise to speak on the topic uh, that's been discussed here over the last hour, and I want to thank my colleagues for focusing on this issue. I, I want to say that yesterday's vote and tonight's vote are tough votes for me, and I think they're tough votes for each of us. We've got a bipartisan uh, compromise that's come forth. There are things in this bill that trouble each of us uh, for different reasons. 
But I think all of us understand that, uh, that our deficit issue is the biggest threat to our country's economic security in many ways to our sovereignty. Over this uh, summer, I had 46 deficit presentations around the state of Tennessee. And I think the thing that people walked away from those meetings, these were large meetings, was the severity of the issue. And I'm not sure that most Americans have really focused on the severity of our debt issue. I think most Americans think that this is going to affect their neighbor, that it might affect another generation, I think a lot of Americans think that if we would do away with things like earmarks, and I don't earmark, that we would solve our problem. That's the thing that I hope to accomplish this summer in Tennessee, was to make people aware of how big this issue is and that the steps we're going to have to take are draconian. I applaud those that have been involved in the, in the process that has just taken place, the Deficit Reduction Commission. And I'm hopeful that sometime very soon in the next few months, we'll either have the opportunity to vote on something similar in nature that deals with real spending constraints. I think all of us know that spending as a percentage of GDP is at all-time highs in modern history. And I think we know that spending has to come under control. At the same time, we understand that in our tax code, we give away each year $1.2 trillion. I think that shocks people. And if we were to eliminate those, and I know Senator Wyden and others have worked on these kind of things, if we would eliminate those, everybody's taxes could be less. We could lower individual rates, we could lower corporate rates, we could help our, help our economy be spurred on. So Madam President, I know that it's irresponsible when a debt ceiling comes before us to not vote for a debt ceiling in that it's like running up a credit card tab and not agreeing to pay the bill. But I've heard a great senator who's getting ready to retire, and I won't say what his name is, say that it's also irresponsible to not be responsible prior to voting on a debt ceiling increase. So it's my hope that sometime between now in April or May or early June, whenever this vote has to take place, then instead of us just talking about this today, and I applaud all those who are, I thank you for that, but that we actually vote on something of substance that deals with this issue in a real way and does not kick the can down the road. This is the issue that could create the greatest crisis in our country, something that, by the way, is totally within our control. Many of the problems we, day, we face as a country, we can't deal with solely ourselves. It involves lots of other people. This is one of those issues that we have totally in our control, and all it takes is the courage to deal with this issue and the, the reasoning that we're not going to get everything exactly the way we want it, but as a group, we've got to have the courage to actually deal with it. So I hope we move more than just to a construct, but just to, but to a real vote. I have a bill on the floor, and I'm thankful that Claire McCaskill has agreed to co-sponsor an amendment to actually this tax bill that I know is not going to pass, probably not even going to have a vote, okay? But to build momentum towards there actually being a construct in place that sequesters spending to really drive us from where we are today to a more responsible place, a place where we've been over the last 40 years. So, Madam President, I thank you for the time. The Senator from Illinois, who I respect, thank you for your forbearance. And with that, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from New Hampshire. I'm pleased to be here on the floor this afternoon to join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to talk about the need for us to deal with our deficits and our debt in this country. Um, I, I've made the decision to vote for the tax cut package that we're going to be voting on this evening. Um, I did that with some, um, some sense of uh, ambiguity because it doesn't adequately put in place a plan to address our debt in this country. And all the economists, however, that I've spoken to have indicated that this is important for us as we're looking at continuing to stimulate our economy and provide the relief that middle class families and small businesses need. 
So despite the fact that there are things in it that I don't like, I I'm going to support it. But I would feel a lot better about it if it contained language that all of us have talked about that says, as part of doing this, once we get this economy moving again, we've also got to address the long-term debt that we face in this country. And make no mistake about it, we've got to do that both by addressing spending and by addressing tax reform. Uh, I was at a small business in Salem, New Hampshire yesterday, a company called MSI. They're a, they do HVAC systems, a small business. They have about 25 employees. And I asked them what, what they were looking for from us in Washington. And they said, a fair, simple tax code. So we've got to get serious about this problem. All we've got to do is to look at what's happening in Europe to know that um, we are headed that way if we don't get this debt under control. And we've got to make some tough decisions that include both tax reform and fiscal restraint. And I would feel better if this language were in the legislation that we're going to be voting on. But I think it's clear that it's a sense of the Senate. I think if we can get this resolution done, it will be important to send that message to everybody in the country about what we need to do. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Florida. Madam President, uh, I want to say to the new Senator from Illinois, uh, thank you for your forbearance. Uh, Ten years ago, this senator made his maiden speech on the floor, and it was about this very same issue. Because then, a decade ago, we had the privilege of having surpluses, and my maiden speech was about exactly, if we didn't watch out, what was going to happen is those surpluses were going to go into deficits, and if we had been good stewards of our condition, we could have paid off the national debt over the course of 12 years, but we took a different direction. Uh, I am to be followed by the senator from Minnesota, the senator from California, and I think what we're hearing here in a bipartisan way, after we are swallowing a bitter pill of what we're going to vote on tonight, that's going to increase the debt $900 billion because under these economic circumstances, it's the right thing to do to jumpstart the economy. I think what we're hearing now is a confluence of events that is going to bring us starkly face to face that we're going to have to reduce the debt and we're going to have to do tax reform. And because the conditions are so raw now, it is our responsibility to explain what we see as the economic circumstances of the country, explain it to the American people, and then act on it. And when emergency conditions arise, there is opportunity, and that is the opportunity to make change for the good. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Minnesota. Uh, Madam President, I also want to acknowledge the new Senator from Illinois and thank him for the time. But I also wanted to acknowledge the senior Senator from Illinois who's here, who just spent uh, the last few months serving honorably on the Debt Commission, on the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility. They came out with some recommendations. And a number of us in this chamber, while we may not support everyone and disagree with some of them, think that that is something that we must pursue. As they wrote in their report, every modest sacrifice that we refuse to make today only forces far greater sacrifices of hope and opportunity upon the next generation. And they're right. The longer we wait, the more wrenching the choices become. And guess who's going to have to make those painful choices? It's our children and our children's children. But you know what else, Ms. Madam President? It's ourselves. As the senator from California pointed out about an hour ago, 6%, 6% of our spending is just interest on that debt. So there are some common sense suggestions that are in that report. That's what we have to do next year. When you look at this idea, people making over $250,000, the fact that just going back to the Clinton levels, 
the Clinton tax levels, when our country was incredibly prosperous, that that would bring in $700 billion to bring down the debt. That's why the majority of the people in this country, the vast majority of the people in this country, want to see that as one of the options for the long term. For the short term right now, we know that our country is still in a fragile state. We know that we can't sock the middle class with a $3,000 tax increase. We know that we have 200 million people that are unemployed through no fault of their own, that are still looking for work. That's why we're passing this bill tonight. But beyond that, as we go to the next year, we must work together, as you see what's going on today in a bipartisan way, to put a plan in place. Because the market will respond to that, it'll be good for our economy, we will show we mean business, and we won't turn into one of those countries overseas that is experiencing what they're experiencing now because they didn't make that long-term commitment. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from California. Madam President, I also am one of those who worried over this vote that we cast yesterday over the weekend. Uh, I spoke on this very floor about the fact I didn't like the estate tax. I didn't think wealthy Americans needed a sustained tax cut. And then I began to make some calls to economists. And what I found was a kind of double-edged sword. One, they did believe that the package had a stimulative nature of anywhere between 0.6 and 1.1 percent. 0.6 is about 600,000 jobs, so 600,000 to a million two jobs. Uh, unemployment insurance was stimulative, the payroll tax cut was stimulative, et cetera, um, and that we needed to do this. But then the flip side, and the flip side was we are now reaching 63 percent of GDP in debt. And what will happen is one day, if this continues, we will just go off a cliff economically. Now, some time ago, during the end of the Bush administration, many of us were on a phone call. And we heard Secretary Paulson and Federal Reserve Bernanke say that we are on the brink of a major collapse of this economy. Everything could go down banks, credit institutions, et cetera. I never thought this could ever happen in America. I now know that the unprecedented can, in effect, happen in America. And that when we vote for a package that puts almost a trillion dollars additional on debt and deficit, that we had better have a way to make a pivot, as some people have called it, and really do those things that can curb expenditures. We are fortunate. This National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility outlines a course, not everything do I agree with, just like the tax bill, but nonetheless, it's a course of action which can bring down this debt and bring down this deficit. I'm very proud of those members who voted to sustain this report. Even with 11 members, I think it gives the kind of substantial ability to this report to bring it before this body. And I would hope that before we have to raise the debt ceiling, that we would have before us a package, that we would set limits on spending, that we would freeze pay across the board, that we would make substantial across the board cuts, in travel, in printing, in those things, not because that's a big item, because it's an item that wakes people up. I found that on a city level, it exists on a state level, and it exists on a federal level. There is much that we can do, and I think at 63% of GDP, this debt and deficit says to America, America be concerned. America and American business come home, build your plants here, help us rebuild this great country, help us build the industries of the future. But at the same time, right now, we've got to make very, I think, very deep cuts across the board. Thank you, and I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Alaska. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to the Senator from Illinois for uh, giving us a little time before you have your maiden speech. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just echo 
and associate my comments with all the members who have spoken previously. And thank Senator Warner and Senator uh, Chambliss for uh, their work in bringing truly a bipartisan approach to how we start the discussion and move forward on deficit management and tax reform, which is critical for this country. You've heard all the statistics, all the numbers, all the reasons why we should do it, but pretty simple. The way I look at this is if there's one issue in my 2008 campaign I talked about at the very beginning of the campaign was about the deficit and what was happening, how much of your tax dollar was going toward paying the debt, paying the interest. I know, Madam President, you spoke about it, the interest costs that are absorbing uh, the amount of the budget here. But in reality, I remember in 08, no one really paid much attention. And then suddenly the crash occurred in 08, at the end of 08. And then everyone wanted to talk about it because it affected them. They now saw the picture. But where we are today is an important point. Tonight we'll have a vote on a tax package that will be just temporary, a two-year fix to a much more complicated problem. Right when I came to the body here, I sat down with a couple senators, both on the Republican side and Democratic side, talked about the issue of reform, and recognized that if we're truly going to change the way our tax code works, we cannot do these bits and pieces. That's be true reform. And so as we move into this next year, 2011, not only do we have to take the tough decisions regarding the deficit, we have to be aggressive about tax reform if you want to create certainty to the business community and our economy. A two-year fix does not do that. So let me, and I know there's many that have spoken before me on all the data points, but just purely put and purely, very simply put, if we do not deal with this now, and now is in the next few months, we will hit that crashing wall, we will hit it hard, and we will not have choices because we have not made a plan regarding the deficit and tax reform. So I thank the people who have put this together, Senator Warner, Senator Chambliss, and thank all the members, the over two dozen Republicans and Democrats that are here tonight talking about the need and the serious situation we are facing regarding the deficit and tax reform. I look forward to next year, and I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Virginia. I just want to, again, thank my colleagues, Senator Chambliss, and uh, there will be more to come. There were a number of other colleagues that uh, couldn't be here, and uh, the Senator from Illinois has been more than kind in his forbearance, and I know he will be part of this, uh, uh, meeting this challenge as well. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor. The Senator